Hello, welcome to A Wash With Colour in East Tyrone. This is the village of Moy, locally known as the Moy. It's a quiet sort of a place, with most people just speeding through on their journey somewhere else. But for me, it's home, a place of heritage, history and beauty. Moy is also a place teeming with painting possibilities and later in the programme I'll be taking a special guest to my local antique dealer to do a little bit of watercolour painting. The name Moy is derived from the Irish and Mike meaning the plain and you can see why when you look about at the surrounding countryside. The village of Moy is situated on the River Blackwater, which forms the district boundary between Tyrone and Armagh. It was built in 1764 by Lord Charlemont. Centred around this elegant square, it was founded as a plantation settlement. It is basically a diamond, a planned village, with many fine Georgian buildings. The square itself was modelled on the village of Bosco Marengo in northern Italy, which Lord Charlemont visited on his travels in 1750. The village was recently twinned with Bosco Marengo, and there is now an inter-exchange of cultures. Moy is connected to the village of Charlemont, named after Lord Charlemont, by this bridge over the River Blackwater. It was built by the engineer William Durgan, who is noted for planning not only Belfast Queen's Island, but also the ported down to Dungannon section of the Ulster Railway. Today there is little left of Lord Charlemont's estate. This is the entrance to the Fort of Charlemont, which was burnt down in 1920 during the Troubles. And this surveillance tower is all that is left of Roxburgh Castle, the Charlemont's secondary home. The tower was built by Lord Charlemont to enable him to keep an eye on his estate. The castle, which once dominated the area, was demolished in 1920 after standing derelict for nearly 30 years. The entrance to the castle still has its gates and screen. This elaborate cast ironwork is said to be the best surviving example of its type in Northern Ireland. It's believed to be the work of the celebrated Dublin iron founder, Richard Turner, who worked here in the mid 19th century. Today the tradition for arts and crafts still continues in the Moy. Kathleen Hobson is a calligrapher and an artist. I think the fact that I am mathematically inclined, that and calligraphy had a, a link for me in that it's a, a meticulous art form rather than something that's very free and loose. And. I'm also interested in illumination and the sort of designs that were created by the old scribes. And it's just a, a natural development where when you do a piece of writing, it's lovely to put colour in it. I've done some pieces, quite serious pieces, where I've just wanted to decorate them with flowers. In particular, the 23rd Psalm, which is, I think, one of the most loved psalms. It talks about green pastures and still waters, and, well, if I'm out for a walk, I'm looking at what's growing in the pastures and even what's growing in the waters. <laughs> and uh, I just feel that as being a pastoral psalm, that particular piece, um, nice to decorate that with flowers. Composition is as important 
in a piece of calligraphy as it is in a painting. It has to look nice as a whole when someone looks at it on the wall. Just having every letter perfect is not enough. The whole layout, the colour, the planning, the spacing, all that has to be thought about. So when the writing is done, then I start to do the colour work. For example, one that I did was a, a miniature painting of a stained glass window, and that took a lot of time because I had to photograph it and get it all reduced down where it was an exact replica of the stained glass window. And finally I sign it and mount it and frame it. The mounting is important. I feel that the presentation is almost as important as the work. When I look around the house, there are so many mediums. I can see pastels, watercolours, oils and your calligraphy. But there's one piece on the wall, the poppies made out of plastic bowls. What's that all about? I've seen flowers pre reproduced in papier-mâché and that to me didn't seem right because flowers are far too fragile for that sort of medium. And I thought, well, plastic is a transparent uh, substance. And if I could work plastic into a flower shape, I think I would get somewhere with it. So I went off and I bought some plastic storage bowls. And with that and a hot plate and a good sharp knife, I cut the petals out and I modelled them on the hot plate. And... Um, well, I finished up with something, a, a three-dimensional study of poppies. Tell me, has the area around here had an influence on the type of work you do? I think most of the work I've done, perhaps, has been a little further afield. I go up to Donegal quite a bit. I love some of the rough scenery in Donegal. And I love some of the, the old cottages and old tin roofs, which is a bit of a joke again with my husband. He says, you're not paint here, there's not a rusty roof. But I just think that those places are worth recording. I don't often paint large, wide open landscapes. I like to zoom in perhaps into what you would call the middle distance. And that's where I find my inspiration. Not far from the Moy is Drumcree, known all over the world for all the wrong reasons. I'm on my way to see some strange figures in the garden and the man who lives there in Drumcree House. Eddie O'Neill has worked all his life as a coppersmith, but in 1969 he developed a new interest. You get tired doing the you know, routine work, so uh, I was bending up metal and bits of copper and then looking at the shape of the metal, you know, and these things appealed to me. So I started welding up bits of copper that I would bend, you know, opposite like shapes, and that's how I got an interest in doing the sculptures. I never hardly make anything unless I really like it myself, you know, and it usually comes from drawings, you know, maybe a 